When we look at today's networks, um, specifically the core transport networks, they haven't really changed over the last 15 years. Uh, we built them in layers. Uh, we have fiber networks uh, on which we apply DWDM. On top of that, we have circuits. And on top of that, we have a packet layer. And each of those overlays is designed by different people, provisioned by different people, has their own restoration and protection rules. So we're, we're basically doing everything three times. And in today's environment where uh, the transport networks have to carry massive amounts of data that doesn't even belong to a service provider, uh, for which they don't get paid, you really want to take all the cost out of that transport network. And we looked at the traffic profiles. We know that the majority of the applications are based on packet, uh, based on IP and packets. We said, you know, let's optimize the core network to do that, to transport those packet-based services. So considering that all of the applications are packet-based, we looked at converging the network, so collapsing some of the architectures to start saving money. And that's where we said, let's focus the convergence around packet switching uh, and integrate that with uh, the optical transport and build out the core that way. Uh, and that's really what became the, um, the converged super core. For, from an execution perspective, we then looked at how to best do that. And we realized that we, we had to basically start from scratch to achieve the speeds, the scale, and the cost goals that we had set forward. And starting from scratch meant going all the way down to um, creating a new ASIC. And, and um, that was an ASIC purely uh, designed for transport functions. Um, so we took out the layer three processing, we um, optimized it for the traffic engineering algorithms, we compressed the, the, the routing tables, we um, optimized the power, we added additional um, CRC checks, um, systems for fast recovery, and even with all that, we, you know, by removing the, com the complexity, we could dramatically increase the scale and the speed. So that's how we got to that ASIC that can support up to t two terabits per slot, um, up to 3,800 terabits of, of total capacity uh, when you cluster these chips. And that became the foundation of the SuperCore switch. Then we designed the platform around that. So based on that switch, we designed a platform that we wanted to give very high density, both for short reach interfaces and for long haul interfaces. And that became the PTX platform. So that platform is designed specifically to perform as a transport switch in the core. Uh, and then the last piece of the puzzle was software. Uh, we wanted to make sure that everything was running Junos, uh, all of our uh, IP products run Junos, also the optical piece run Junos, which optimizes the interaction between these layers, allows us to come up with you know, faster provisioning, better automation, restoration, protection schemes, where the communication between the different layers happens at a very low level. Uh, when you do that with separate systems, you have the challenge of having to have management systems interoperate, which by default means they communicate at higher layers in the OSI stack. Uh, it, it, it creates delays, it creates more complexity. So having the same operating system running on every system of the super core simplifies things a lot. And then we extended that to a management system that really goes edge to edge and that allows us to drive provisioning from the services layer, not the other way around. Um, so far, People used to build networks and then they would look at what services they would run on that. Uh, now the network has to do the opposite because you're no longer controlling all the services uh, and you want to optimize your network to carry the services you have to carry. So any uh, service that requires a connection, uh, we signal that through the network. We go find for the best path. We go look for the best path. We look, is there uh, uh, an LSP? Uh, available? Um, is there an OTN pad available? Is there a wavelength available? And if not, we set those up. If there are pads available, we actually merge that into the existing pad. So it's a, it's a network that is driven by the services, not the other way around. Uh, GMPLS is, cer is certainly a part of that, of that sign signaling uh, mechanism in the control plane. Um, so, so that perspective is not new. Now, Juniper was instrumental in creating
creating GMPLS in, in the early 2000s where we were looking at you know, uh, bringing optical switching into the network and having basically all the, all the core uh, routers interconnected to opti optical switches directly. Uh, so, but it's just a little piece. Um, I think the, the, the core packet switch is also an idea that, that was borrowed from, from the past. Um, in the early 2000s, many companies uh, were trying to create that type of product. Uh, the challenge was that there was no need for it. Um, you know, it was perfectly fine and doable to build a fully IP routed network in the early 2000s because you, there was a much stronger tie between the edge and the core. The core was really also a services platform. There was not this, this, this um, explosion of bandwidth. There were not the challenges of, of content and applications and, and end users moving through the network like they do today. And that's why that ultimately never materialized. Today, with that challenge of a bandwidth explosion, mobility, uh, cloud applications that change the dynamics of the traffic that flows through the network, and the cost pressure um, driven, driven by that intermediation where the majority of the revenue of the services that are carried through the network does not go to the owner of the network, it really became important to optimize that transport infrastructure and take the cost out of it but making sure that in doing that you were not impacting the quality of the services that were created at the edge. And that was also a driver behind the SuperCore and a driver behind creating uh, those very specific chipsets. With an OTN network, you're always going to have a, uh, a static network. These are fixed time slots. It is a TDM technology, so it's a fairly static network. There's no notion of a control plane. Uh, that allows you to flexibly reconfigure these connections. So uh, if you have that type of transport network, you have to be able to do a very high level of aggregation at the edge of the network in order to fill those pipes through the core of the network. And that's exactly where the problem lies because it becomes increasingly difficult to do that aggregation. You can do that if you have a very static uh, traffic flow. Now flows are changing both in the space and the time domain. As mentioned, um, three years ago you could watch video over the internet, but you could only do that when you did it at home in front of your PC which was physically connected to the network using DSL or your cable connection. Uh, now with mobility and the increasing capabilities of the mobile access network and the um, abundance of devices that allow you to consume content, you can do this while you're on the move. You can watch a movie while you're on the train. So now the network really has to follow you as you progress on that train track and that's a flow that is changing because you're hitting different cell towers so now that stream has to be accommodated in different parts of the network. The same thing is going to happen with cloud computing even worse. You're running virtual applications in data centers and you could run them anywhere. Consumers can access them anywhere. And, and I have a hard time believing that the same applications will run in the same data centers every day. Uh, it's going to be you know, very difficult to predict what applications are running, running where. So you're going to create massive changes in traffic, sh shifts in traffic flows that you have to be able to accommodate. And you can really only do that if you pool your resources and that takes you back to packet technology. So even if we use OTN as a transport mechanism, you know, we think we are better able to fill these pipes than the actual OTN vendors because of that effect that we can dynamically aggregate at the packet level we know where everything has to go, we can buffer a little bit of these packets and fill these payloads to the, to the extent possible before we ship them over the network. So that, that effect of statistical gain is something that has often been overlooked uh, and that gives you actually again you know, economic advantages because you can use the resources in the network more efficiently. The only way to really handle that with, with, a, with an optical um, uh, equipment or circuit is to over provision. And that then gets you back to, well, that's more expensive, then the network is underutilized. So, so it brings you back to, well, then what am I trying to achieve? Because I'm, I'm exactly trying to take the cost out of the network.
It's all standards based. So it's fully um, standards compliant. So any product that um, um, uses MPLS or can um, create LSPs or pseudo wires can interface with our PTX switch. So, so that's an additional advantage that we believe we have in this market. We can, we can introduce the concept of a super core uh, in a Juniper network, but we can also introduce it in a non-Juniper network. So we can ult ultimately help everybody uh, in this industry uh, uh, building a lower cost transport network without really impacting the devices at the edge. Uh, we've always worked with partners. Um, ever since um, Juniper was created, we've always had partnerships, technology partnerships, um, go-to-market partnerships, and, and this is exactly uh, the same. Um, you know, in order to accelerate the go-to-market of this product, we, um, we, we uh, partner with, amongst others, uh, Alva, who provides us with the basic infrastructure uh, the optical shelves, the amplifiers, uh, rodent technology. Uh, but then we complement that with um, our own designs. We um, actually run Junos, our own operating system, on the Adva shelves. Uh, we then you know, um, create the management system around it. So we use those technologies from partners, integrate them in a Juniper solution, and, and um, that is what creates a much more powerful message towards our customers because we say no we can provide this end-to-end -end. there's no there's no um, risk of having multiple people providing each their piece of technology uh, you know having issues with network management so it's a Juniper solution sold by Juniper managed by Juniper supported by Juniper the, the product will go into field trial second half of this year and um, so Right now, we have been working with customers that have, you know, that, that have expressed interest in, in trialing the product, um, and it will become generally available first quarter of next year. Uh, the people that will initially deploy it are really, it, it's a healthy mix of, of content providers, um, but also um, service providers that don't necessarily have a, a lot of legacy traffic. So content providers, have the advantage that they have no, they have no legacy history, so to speak. They don't have circuits. It's all IP based, and it's really a, a matter of moving content or, or packets, information between their data centers and onto their end users. Um, there's also a, a fair amount of interest out of the the cable industry because they have less legacy as well. So that's where we believe uh, the initial deployments will come from, and that's going to be deployments primarily as an MPLS switch. Uh, and later on, we'll see integrated optics um, go into these networks and then potentially followed by uh, a, a very basic level of OTN switching if it is still needed at that time.